We took about seven years to build the Pompidou Centre. We had a lot of political problems. We were taken to court regularly um, for things like there was, no, there was a law saying that foreigners can't do cultural buildings for France, a law which had been designed and uh, the fascist period and no one had bothered under. So we had a lot of problems. So it took a long time. Was, and the only good thing, I suppose one of the good things was that Renzo and I, being in our thirties, were very naive and we didn't realize it was really impossible. So we went on and did it. But at the end of it, there was no other work. Nobody wanted another Pompidou Center. Now, the fact that we thought we could do other things didn't seem to come across. Um, I went to teach in the States, uh, in LA and at Yale. Uh, my closest partner, John Young, became a taxi driver and Renzo set up a small firm in France and had a tiny bit of, of work. I didn't really want to teach, I have to tell you, but then there was a competition for Lloyds of London. Lloyds had one person on the board who had heard of the Royal Institute of British Architects. For once, the Royal Institute of British Architects had a very good president. Um, I'm obviously biased as we won that competition. Um, and uh, advised Lloyds about us and five other people like Norman Foster, and Pei and so on. We had this competition and to everybody's surprise, we won it. Now it is truly different, everything is different. I mean, if we were building more or less uh, a fun palace in Paris, this is a club. Lloyd started in a coffee house in 1760 something, um, where financiers met sailors, captains of boats, and they did transactions. So it's as, as traditional as you can, as, and you know, the only piece of technology when we went to see the Lloyd's building inside, I think the highest point was a, a Xerox machine, and people, some people still had, were writing with feathers and ink, you know, it was that, it really was. It was, very, it was backward only in the process, of course it was the most famous insurance firm in the world, so there was a, a very cutting edge element uh, within that. But we were certainly very strange people, uh, or may say very strange bedfellows for Lloyd's. And here Lloyd's really was a grey, black, bit of light grey maybe, organisation. I mean everybody wore it, everybody, the buildings were like it and so on. Um, we were again extremely fortunate, the same way as on, on, on Pompidou. The real critical thing in architecture is having a good client. A good client is not someone who says yes, it's a client who is engaged in the evolution of the building, who responds. And it's better to have no, because you can probably find another way of doing it, writing it, shooting it. Whatever your art is, the really difficult one is, is well, I, I leave it to you, I don't care. And then at the end it says no. So here we were heavily engaged. We spent half a day every month with the whole board of Lloyds to discuss every part of it. We were able to convince Lloyds that we would put the mechanical services on the outside because mechanical services have a short life. In other words, it's like the engines of a car. And the buildings have hundreds of years' life. Streets have thousands of years. It's the medieval streets, or streets now that are there, a medieval street. Things which have a short life we'll put on the outside, keep the floors clear, because Lloyds said they wanted two things. They wanted a building that would last into the next century. We made that one. And they wanted a building which would meet their changing needs. So then they produced lots of graphs to show the changing needs. And of course, the moment we finished Lloyd's, there's one of the big economic crises. And London was about to fly to Frankfurt. And I remember well, everybody discussing, including Lloyd's, where they should move to Frankfurt, because Frankfurt was going to be the capital, business capital of Europe. And it's very interesting to think, because today London is so clearly the business capital of Europe and probably of the world, maybe of New York. So we were dealing with people who knew about change, knew about risk, but had a, an, a clue about art. The ducks, the pieces on the outside, allowed us to play a game with light and shadow. We were able to create a fifth elevation, a roof, and bring these big service towers up so that on the skyline you saw all these elements. You know, I have no great love for high tech, but it did explain something. We do believe in the process of construction. Lloyd's was built uh, in concrete with a certain amount of steel on the outside, and Pompidou was built in steel. I know we've just finished an airport in Madrid, which the way the interiors is wood. I suppose one would like to think one uses the appropriate materials, but of course appropriate materials are also shaped by the time you live in, where you live in. It's shaped by the machinery you yourselves are using here. Um, you know, when you look at the beauty of cameras, when you look at the, the beauty of watches and so on, this certainly influenced you. Um, as, it, as the same thing happened in the 15th century, 
you were influenced by what was happening at that time with perspective, which was invented in the 14th century. Uh, that clearly influenced the way that buildings were designed. So we use the technology of today and the technology of yesterday, when it's appropriate, to build the buildings of today. We thought Lloyd's was the absolute ultimate in the art of technology. When I look at it now, it's handmade practically. Then people say, well, it's technology, uh, and therefore it's, it's a, a high-tech building. I don't, it, it's a bit too easy, but it's okay. We managed to persuade Lloyds, and Lloyds permitted to persuade us, in such a way that we moved very well together. Uh, then we got bows on, and I, perhaps I, the other unspoken hero, which I should say, which is Peter Rice, who joined us on the Pompidou, who was, was a brilliant engineer from Earth Arabs. And he guided us as a philosopher, as well as a technologist and engineer as he was. He was Irish and had clearly kissed the Blarney Stone and could persuade us in the most wonderful and quiet way. And he was really the, uh, we were so well, unfortunately he died of cancer, um, with him and he was a, a, a terrific guy. Anyhow, once more we were attacked by everybody, well, a year before the end, a bit like uh, the Bow book, uh, a year before the end of the, of the building, um, there was an investigation by the Bank of England into the, what was going on at Lloyd's. So the chairman and everybody else had to resign. The next chairman hated us. So we had a very tough last year. And the only perhaps worthwhile story telling that when, the, when Lloyd's opened, the Queen opened it, of course, um, and I sat next to the Dean of St. Paul's, and he said, I remember him very well. He said, you, Do you feel beleaguered? A word is. I now remember well. Um, I said, yes, I'm being attacked on all sides, oppressive, you know, and so on. And he told me this little story about Wren, which I think we should all remember. He said, Wren was in his 70s when he at glass got St. Paul's built. He'd started 30 years beforehand. He was so tired of being, having his building attacked and turned down that by the time he got to building St. Paul's, he put a 20-foot wattle fence all around the site so nobody could see it. So even... St. Paul's was a shock of the new. We think it's there forever, ever since. And Prince Charles thinks it's been there forever, but it hasn't. And it was a risky building to do it in those times, which is why it is great. <laughs>